Hey everyone, welcome back to Clinical Physio with me, Khalid Maidan. In today's video, we're going to be taking you through all you need to know about palpation of the knee joint. Now when we're palpating, we're feeling for key things such as swelling, laxity and tone, but perhaps most importantly is pain, as this may tell us the most about our patient's condition. So as to not slow your video down, we're not going to be palpating our patient's right and left knees in this video. However, in clinical practice, we always want you to palpate both sides so you can compare the two and inform your patient diagnosis. So with that in mind, let's get into our main video. Let's get clinical. So we're going to complete our palpation of the knee in an anterior and a posterior view. And we're going to start in an anterior view with our patient in a supine or long sitting position on the plinth with their knee extended. So the first thing to do is to palpate around the joint for swelling. So we'll be on the medial side, around the superior aspect of the patella, round to the lateral side, and we can just gently palpate around the knee joint line. When patients have excess fluid at the knee, it will try to disperse from the joint line to surrounding areas. For example, it's commonplace to find swelling superior to the patella. So, as we said, we can palpate this specifically on the patient's affected side and compare it to the other side. We, need, we can even measure the circumference around this part of the patient's leg, uh, so we have an objective marker for our swelling. And other common areas of swelling, as we said, are just either side of the patella or slightly distal to the joint line here. From here, we're going to palpate the patella itself. Uh, we can start by gently gliding the patella from the medial to lateral size, just from right to left like so, and we can compare that to the other side. And we're looking to see if the patella mobilizes easily within the joint on both sides, or for signs that may show an issue with patella maltracking. For example, if there is pain or stiffness or clicking when you mobilize the patella towards the medial or lateral sides around the femoral groove. Any of these signs can give you more evidence to suspect a patella maltracking problem. Also consider if your patient has a history of patella dislocations, they may present with excessive movement of the patella in either a medial or lateral direction. We can also use Clark's test to look for signs of patellofemoral pain syndrome. Here, the therapist places the web of their hand on the superior aspect of the patella and applies gentle downward pressure. This patella compression by itself can create pain in its own right. It's quite a provocative test. Um, Clark's test itself involves maintaining this pressure and then asking the patient to contract their quadriceps muscle. Um, when a pain indicates dysfunction, when the patella glides proximately within the femoral groove. As we said, be aware that Clark's test is quite a provocative test uh, in its own right, so you may not need to complete Clark's test if patella compression by itself without the quadriceps contraction is already painful. However, if patella compression is not painful, Clark's test can be an effective way of differentiating whether or not your patient presents with a patellofemoral joint dysfunction, if this test reproduces the patient's symptoms that they've previously reported. So next, we can palpate the patella tendon from the patella itself. We move downwards towards the tibial tuberosity, and the tibial tuberosity is the prominent central um, bony um, point that you can feel once you have palpated past the knee joint. And any pain here may tell you about conditions such as a patella tendonitis. We can then palpate the tibial tuberosity itself, um, which can be more painful to palpate if your patient presents with a condition such as Oscar Schlatter's. Finally, in this view, we can bring the patient's knee into a 90 degree flex position as this will open up the joint line a little bit more. So we can start here by repalpating the patella tendon. So we'll palpate from the distal patella down through the tendon onto the tibial tuberosity. And we're palpating for any swelling or checking if this increases the patient's pain, which may tell us about a patella tendon injury. From the patella tendon, we can then palpate along the medial aspect of the joint line 
right round to the very medial side of the knee. And from here, we're palpating the anterior horn of the medial meniscus and round towards the medial joint line. And then we can do the same on the lateral side, palpating from the patellar tendon round the anterior lateral part of the joint line and round towards the lateral aspect of the knee. Again, one of the main structures that we're palpating is the lateral meniscus from the anterior horn round to the lateral side. And again, we're palpating to see if we uh, find any swelling on palpation of the area or if this reproduces your patient's pain, which may tell you about a meniscal injury or signs of osteoarthritis for your older patient. From there, we can follow the joint line round to the medial side, right round to the medial side, where we can palpate the medial collateral ligament, which originates at the medial femoral epicondyle here. And then we can palpate through the joint line where the medial collateral ligament runs onto the medial tibial condyle and the proximal shaft of the tibia. We can then come over to the lateral side where we uh, palpate the lateral collateral ligament, uh, which is shorter than the medial collateral ligament, and it originates from the lateral femoral epicondyle here. And then we run, we move our thumb through the joint line and onto the head of the fibula, the lateral aspect of the head of the fibula. Uh, a point of interest for each of these regions is that when you're palpating the medial collateral ligament, you really have to make sure you're on the, med the very medial aspect of the joint line. Uh, sometimes we'll find people palpate the anteromedial aspect of the joint line, but this isn't actually where the ligament is. It's right on the medial side. And similarly for the lateral collateral ligament, you have to be right on the lateral part of the knee rather than the anterolateral aspect of the knee. And there's also an additional ligament on the lateral side that is not commonly referred to in textbooks, which is the anterolateral ligament. And this originates also from the lateral femoral condyle, but rather than inserting onto the fibula head like the lateral collateral ligament does, it inserts onto the lateral tibial condyle. And so when we're palpating either the medial or lateral ligaments, we're looking to see if this reproduces the patient's pain, or we're palpating for any swelling, which may tell us about a soft tissue injury to either of those ligaments. Also to palpate here is the pezanserine region. And there are three muscles whose tendons insert into the anteromedial surface of the tibia in line with the tibial tuberosity. And these three muscles are the sartorius muscle, the gracilis muscle, and the semitendinosus muscle. Underneath those three tendons lies the pezanserine bursa, inflammation of which is called pezanserine bursitis, which can occur due to things like overuse of the hamstring muscle, particularly the semitendinosus muscle, or when you have a patient who presents with a genuvalgus posture. So we palpate this region in particular to check if this recreates the patient's pain, or we palpate to see if there is swelling present, which may give us an indication of the pezanserine bursitis. So now we have our patient lying in a prone position so that we can palpate structures on the posterior aspect of the knee in a posterior view. And there are a couple of different structures that we are palpating here. First are the hamstring tendons. The hamstring tendon of semitendinosus inserts into the pezanserine region on the anteromedial aspect of the knee, as we saw in the anterior view. So the uh, tendons that we're palpating here is that of semimembranosus, which inserts into the posterior aspect of the medial tibial condyle, and the tendons of the biceps femoris muscle, uh, which insert onto the head of the fibula here, and also onto the lateral tibial condyle here. And we palpate these regions to assess for local inflammation with signs such as swelling or pain on palpation, which may implicate these tendons in your patient's condition. A point of interest, if you're finding it difficult to find these tendons but when you palpate with your patient's knee extended, you can bring their knee into an approximately 70 degree 
uh, flex position and ask them to resist your isometric pressure. This will make it more clear where the tendons run and may make your palpation a little bit easier. Next, we can palpate the originating tendons of the gastrocnemius. The gastrocnemius has a medial head and a lateral head. The medial head inserts onto the posterior aspect of the medial femoral condyle, and the lateral head inserts onto the posterior aspect of the lateral femoral condyle. If your patient presents with pain on palpation of any of the tendons we have uh, looked at here, you can progress your palpation onto the muscle belly of that particular uh, tendon, so you can see if their pain represents a general contractile dysfunction of the whole muscle or an irritation of just that tendon specifically. Finally, we are going to palpate the central posterior aspect of the knee at the joint line, which is also known as the popliteal space. A Baker cyst occurs due to the distension of the posterior joint capsule, potentially including irritation to various local bursae. Therefore, if you have a patient with a Baker cyst, you'll be able to palpate a swelling lump in this area, which is often painful to palpate as well. The other reason to palpate in this region is because pain due to a medial posterior horn meniscus injury or a lateral posterior horn meniscus injury or a posterior crucial ligament injury can also present itself on palpation of this space. Also, the tibial nerve runs through this compartment. So if your palpation reproduces paresthesia in the lower leg, this may be an indication of an irritable tibial nerve. So here are the key points to summarize this video on palpation of the knee joint. Break down your palpation of the knee into an anterior and posterior view, ensuring you compare both the affected and unaffected sides. When palpating your patient's knee joint, look for deformity, swelling, laxity, tone, and most importantly, pain. You can also look for signs of specific pathology in each view, as we have highlighted throughout the video. And that completes our video on palpation of the knee joint. Next, I'd like to suggest you have a look at our other videos within the knee catalogue here on Clinical Physio, including observation of the knee. Thank you as always for watching. We'll see you again soon, right here on Clinical Physio.